looks for what is good, which unfortunately for human beings often is not what is desired. It is the human catastrophe in one point of view that we often desire what is not good. And love comes to replace that under God. But the world is formed around human desire. John continues in that second chapter of 1 John to say the world is passing away and the desires lusts thereof. We don't have a real good word to translate epithumia. And so we wind up with the old word, old word lust and people find it easy to say, well, I don't do that. But the real problem is desire, intensive desire. And we need to identify the problem that goes on in the world. Now, in the world, the mind is set on the flesh. And so we go back to Romans 8 now. Uh, they that are living in terms of the flesh mind the things in the flesh. And the flesh, if you will excuse me, I just, the flesh is simply the natural powers of human beings. The world is the flesh organized historically and socially. So it all comes back to the natural powers of human beings apart from God. And the mind of the spirit, on the other hand, is what characterizes those who live in terms of the spirit. And the spirit is primarily God, though we need to make a lot of distinctions there when we come to discuss it. Now, spiritual transformation then is the process of moving from conformity to the world to conformity to the kingdom of God. That's my first way of characterizing it, and I'm going to come back to it and characterize it in other ways. It is a process, spiritual formation. It should always be called transformation because spiritual formation is simply already there by the time you turn around. And so the problem from the Christian point of view is never formation. Everyone gets one, no matter what you do. It's like education. Um, the problem is the one we've got. And the difficulty then is to move from that to conformity to the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, this is new language for some people. And it is troublesome for many folks. So I need to spend just a little time there. Uh, to speak of spiritual formation actually is old language, very ancient, in the Catholic tradition. And that's enough to send some people over the side of the boat right there. <laughs> and actually the word that we, was used before that was institution. Um, St. John Cassian, for example, has a, a marvelous book on the institutes. And some of you recognize Calvin calling his the institutes. It's actually the same meaning in the history as formation. Formation is, has to do with taking on a form. And we talk about instituting a character or a form, or we form an institute uh, for Carl Henry or something of that sort. No, we've got a center here. Um, so th that language is very ancient. But for various reasons, which I'll not be able to go into today, except if you ask about it, uh, <coughs> dropped away. Now, we had a period coming from post-Reformation time up to the present where you have various ways of talking about this. The one constant idea is spiritual growth. That's the one constant idea. And of course that's tied primarily to, again, one of the most famous verses in the scripture, which is 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow. So spiritual growth, now that's the constant. You have different words for it. 
and uh, different meanings developed in it. But that is what we are basically talking about. For the Christian, spiritual formation is nothing but the, prog the procession of the individual taking on the character of Christ. Spiritual growth for the Christian. Now spirituality in our world today has taken uh, 1800 different forms. And a lot, of, a lot of that was a matter of people hungering for something and not getting it from where they were and turning to various other sources, perhaps most commonly understood as New World, but actually New World is the oldest world on human record. It's radically the same all the way back to 4000 BC uh, in the Eastern world. So now, what does that look like in practice? Well, we have all kinds of illustrations of it, but I must uh, fill it out to some degree here. Uh, for example, here's a version of spiritual formation. This is Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character. Proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now you will find parallel passages to that in Romans 8, 1 through 11, in Colossians 3, especially verses 8 through 14, and above all, in 2 Peter 1, verses 4 through 10. Uh, these are descriptions of a procedure, a process, that human beings go through as they live as disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to reiterate that everyone gets a spiritual formation. Hitler had a spiritual formation. In general, formation simply has to do with the character that is developed in people. That's formation in general. Christian spiritual formation, it's important to know the difference now is the process through which the inner and outer dimensions of human personality take on the character of Jesus Christ himself. What would that look like? That would look like someone who loves God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and their neighbor as themselves. That would be the outcome of spiritual formation in Christ. Okay. I doubt that anyone in this room would say we don't want to go there. Uh, obviously, that is what it is about. But we do have a theological background at present which leads many people to say either this is impossible. You cannot do this. A substantial part of our intellectual theological climate holds the view that brokenness is the top rung of the ladder of spiritual growth. Brokenness. That's as far as you get. And I just pause over that because I think it takes time to realize what that means. Now brokenness is an important stage to pass through and once you've passed through you carry with you no confidence in the flesh. That's what Paul lays out in Philippians 3. No confidence in the flesh. But beyond that, you place confidence 
in the Spirit, in God, in His Word. And as a result, the transformation goes forward. It goes forward by working with each of these dimensions of personality that are set forth by Jesus in Mark chapter 12, where he answers the lawyer's question as to who uh, or what is the, is the first commandment. That is the commandment that contains all the rest of them. And so here in the teachings of Jesus, and then later in the writings of the apostles, love is said to be the first commandment. And uh, I think we often don't understand the importance of looking to love as the landmark, <laughs> the landmark of the disciple. Now once again, that's Jesus' idea. After telling, or in the process of telling his apostles that he was leaving and that he would uh, go to prepare a place for them, he tells them, commands them to love one another as he had loved them. And then he says, there's one mark of the disciple of Jesus, and that is how they love one another. Not how they love the world, nor particularly uh, their neighbor. That's, of course, commanded. Uh, but the mark was to be the love of Christians toward one another in their community. Now, you might search to see if that is the mark that is held up for membership in our groups. That would be a good thing uh, to try to understand. Uh, is it there or is there something else that is the mark of the Christian? Now, he said disciple. We don't think in terms of disciples automatically, as I have already said. Now, what is the mark of the Christian? And I just pause to let that soak in because I don't think the answer is very obvious. And certainly, we want to say that Christians are not just ones who have arrived at the pinnacle of loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves. Right. There's a bumper sticker that I often mention because it is so profound that says, Christians are not perfect, only forgiven. That's certainly true, that they're not perfect. But there's a large difference between only forgiven and being perfect. And that's the area of the process that one goes through in coming to the fullness of Christ. So going back to some of our passages that I mentioned, for example, Colossians 3, 8 through 14 talking about the new person that is put on, in which there is no Greek, no Jew, no circumcision, no uncircumcision, no Greek, no Jew, no barbarian, no Scythian, no bond, no free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has something against another, even as Christ forgiven you, so you forgive them. And then, above all this, putting on agape, the bond of perfectness. It's what ties completion together and holds it in place. Love comes out at the top. You see the same thing when you look at uh, 2 Peter 1. I don't want to take time to go through that now. But I hope you will, because I think actually 2 Peter 1, 4 through 10 is one of the clearest statements of the process of spiritual formation that you will find in the New Testament. I actually think that's because it was uh, a little later than the other New Testament writings at least.